So maybe you have thoughts or reactions from the reading or the video. I just um I have I've been reading the Jewish the chosen people things mm -hmm. for a while and um they now they have some broadcasting JBS now that's three eighty eight that's pretty interesting but they really followed the biblical prophecies you know about the coming and everything and and some of them because they're having such a rough time with judgment of people and Jews feel that they're going to be a major part of welcoming Christ or somehow they're going to help bring Christ in uh, at that time mm. and they'll participate to it. and uh, the one night I was watching them but they actually got excited about it <laughs> on TV you know they felt, felt good because I feel so sorry for them they have so much bad things said about them now. Mm. Yeah. the thing that that struck me is that um He's talking only about judgment of Christians uh, and not judgment of others because it has to do with whether you believe in Christ or not. And if you don't believe in Christ, you don't follow Christ's teaching, then that will be part of the judgment on you. But I can't believe that, that people who who follow their own um, religious practices, which include many of Jesus' teachings, you know, to feed the uh, the hungry and clothe the naked and that kind of thing, that, that they won't um, go to their version of heaven again or wherever it is their religion tells them to go. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems very narrow to me. Mm -hmm. There's no. <laughs> but they're speaking to a Christian audience and these true but and these uh, presentations mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like there's also a lot of particularly in the the workbook mm -hmm. and even the passages that they selected the resumption of that, like, we have this idea of judgment in common, how it's going to work out. And there is this weird phrase in the workbook. There's no particular value in the statement. I just can't believe God would be like that. Our personal opinions about God don't really carry much weight. <laughs> wow. The way we said that when I was in church is, who are you to question God? Yeah, somebody, uh, this is a secondhand book, but somebody wrote in, uh, uh, not comfortable with this, my ideas of, of what is, is good, uh, that uh, it's all about the final judgment. They, they said, no, like you do. I think most people, Many people think when when you hear judgment, you think negative. You're gonna get you're gonna get what's coming to you. Then it's kind of like, ooh, you know, I was bad and I'm caught. And I don't think that's really what judgment means. Will you say more? Well, um, I think that Christ sees us as we really are and the intentions of our heart and not our actions alone because I know that I fall very short very often in the way I would like to live. And so uh, I'm not afraid of judgment because I think Christ sees us different. I don't think it's gonna be very comfortable. <laughs> you know, when, when I have to look at myself I used to think that I would see all of the shortcomings. And that's not a very good place to, to be. But I don't really feel that way anymore. I think I see that now in this life. But I don't think that's going to be part of eternal life. What do you 
take the eternal life on the night? I don't know. I I believe what I read and that it will be perfection as it was intended in the beginning, as God saw us in the beginning. But I don't know what that's like. I'm kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> Personally, I don't believe in hell. I believe that God made us all and he's going to bring us all home. And when I read this, it made me feel like, well, again, kind of like what you pointed out, who are you to decide, you know, to make that call, to make that judgment that, that that's what you believe. So I just felt very conflicted, like, but that's what I believe. But then they're saying, you can't believe what you believe. It was confusing. Yeah. I just don't think he's leaving any other spot. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that he put that phrase up from the Nicene Creed, right? He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and God's kingdom will have no end. And God's kingdom will have no end. Does that mean that it's limitless? In terms of who's in it? Or does that mean it's timeless? Maybe it's both. Maybe it's modifying the kind of judgment that happens. My kingdom has no end. I love that. I've never heard that interpretation of my kingdom has no end. It, it broadens, it widens, it opens it rather than long term eternity. Yeah. I hadn't heard it before either, but I thought of it this morning. All right. <laughs> Right on that. Well, because yeah. he says, and you know, like if you think about the whole sentence, he will come again in glory. Mm -hmm. So I think so much is contingent on like what these words or phrases do for you. Is it glorious that you cannot abide somebody who has a blemish? Or is it glorious that you can? Yeah. I think I know. <laughs> I didn't find much glory in people who um, can't abide blemishes because well, no, they're lying to themselves no, anyway. Perfect. It just doesn't seem glorious to me. Yeah. No, I think probably everybody's perfect. I think that that's the better way to say it. <laughs> Instead of nobody is, I think everybody probably is. And when we draw these categories, I don't find that glorious. I find that the opposite of glory. Now, I'd like to really believe what I'm saying. I believe it. I'd like to really believe it. And I struggle with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do. It's, this is hard. Struggle with <clears throat> You're going to finally get there. And you're going to have to stand there and listen to every bad thing you ever did. And everybody else is going to hear it. And everybody it. else is going to hear it. That, and I'm That's, like, yeah. what's the purpose of that? A, I'm not sure. I don't know where that idea comes from that really strong interpretation that like your life is on a movie screen and since you've got eternity you can watch everybody's lives forever and you've got to account for all these bad things you and do. you have to account for it or everybody will know, your grandmother will know that you kissed your boyfriend when you were 12 <laughs> and it'll break her heart it's very guilt very yeah. shame inducing I mean, the only frame is maybe if that's how it's going to be, which I can't imagine, is that everybody will be like, oh, just like us, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of, instead of, how could you? Because you'll be watching Granny too, right? <laughs> and so like, maybe, maybe the positive, again, I don't, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's But if it true. were, maybe the positive is like, oh, you're only as sick as your secrets. And now look, all that's out. So you don't have to be afraid anymore. So what's the purpose of exposing all of that? Well, I think traditionally the purpose is to create shame and fear so you won't do bad things again. I just don't think it works. 
I mean, any psychologist I know will tell you that shame is correlated with bad behavior, not good behavior, like drug addiction, alcohol abuse, chronic dropout. This, these are shame behaviors. Say that again. Shame is correlated with bad behavior. Okay, because my father, father was a minister. And, this, and I used uh, the month before he died, I visited him every weekend. And his thing was he did not want to meet God because he hadn't lived up to anything. Yeah, uh, so I just, it makes you wonder. And I want to say, like, I find that a little bit embedded in this particular reading. Yeah. Surely that's a misinterpretation, right? I mean, I guess my personal opinions don't matter. They don't carry much weight. I just won't worship a God that is any other way. I won't, because yeah. I don't see anything worth worshiping. Uh, maybe I'm going to hell for that. I don't know. I I just, I don't know how we did this. I don't know how we got here and decided this is like the way to be. All those ancient thinkers and writers and men way back then and people who were, thought they were in charge. And then they came up with these ideas and I think it was to keep people from what they were thinking. Keep them in line, keep people in line, keep people in the church, keep people. I, I think maybe. It's just, I don't, it's know if we, I don't know if it's because we confuse like our perspective of judgment and like say this must be divine because uh, it's what we do you know like um if we don't transfer our justice system into god but let's just be honest like our own justice system isn't particularly fair i hope you don't mind me saying this um a you do your time and then what no one will hire you that's not really just I mean, if you if it's going to jail is how you repay your debt and you do it, then you did. So why should you be a second class citizen the rest of your life? Well, because you did that thing when you were nineteen. I just heard on the news about a man who stole a car. When he was like 17 or 18, and he was given 75 years. <laughs> you know, and I look, I get that, like, hey, there needs to be accountability, and I get that that's hard to figure out. I'm just not sure that because there has to be accountability socially, that, that hell forever makes sense. I don't, I mean, I actually find purgatory to be much more compassionate. Because it's there's accountability, mm -hmm. but then it's over. <laughs> it's not like forever. I mean, that just seems like a lot. It just makes m more sense. Like if my kid tells me a lie, I'm not going to spank her the rest of her life. That wouldn't make sense. You you, of course, you, in the future you'll you'll be wary. Is this the truth or not? Like that is an enduring consequence. Mm -hmm. yeah. But hopefully, trust is regained. And you're able to be less wary. But to say you lied when you were three, so you need to put on a liar on every job application for the, the rest of your life, we didn't. Is that, I mean, that's not, that's not justice. It's not justice. What kind of judgment is that? It's like not very good. Again, that goes back to how do we see God's character? If we see God as yeah and harsh and punishing then we see that happening to us i don't see god that way yeah and i think that probably the reason i think it's important is not i mean i guess on the one hand it's like well so what is like how is god's judgment different from ours and then the really critical thing is then how do we bend our sense of judgment to look more like God's? I mean, I'm pretty hard on myself, to be honest. 
maybe because I think God's going to be hard on me later. I, I don't know. Or because I'm hard on myself, God must be hard. I, I'm probably hard. And, you know, I could be hard on other people, but but listen, I get the hardest. <laughs> the hardest judgment I have is for myself. I'm usually gentler with other people than I am with myself. So like, I think part of the invitation is to like really think that through. I did three confessions yesterday. I did three. That's more than I've done in the last four years. This is interesting. People wanted to do this. And they were all really different. And I was talking very obliquely about this to my spouse yesterday, who's in the middle of three trials. It's very busy. And she just sort of asked, like, like, what is it like for you to do that? Not, what do they confess? Because that's not a thing I share. I don't share who it is, right? This is sort of interesting. First person, it was almost like they were confessing that they're having a hard time. Reasonably so. I'm not sure that's a confession. This, like, I have some despair. <laughs> that's really different from a thing you did, right? The second person said, I've got a, I've got like a condition of holding on to things that I know I should let go of, and I just keep holding on. It's a little different. That's more of like a quality. The third person had a thing they did that, that had big consequences for their family. All very different. And how to engage them differently was really interesting to think through. Now or at the moment you did it? Both and. I mean, at the moment, you know, there's these things we do, like the more you do it, you have like instincts and you think yeah. like, this is this is what I perceive this person needs. And, and maybe you ask about it. You know, so like if somebody tells you a story, for me, I do think it's good listening to say like, I just want to be clear on what you're confessing. Are you confessing this and this and this and this? I'm wondering if you're also doing this. And I don't know if that's my thing, but the first five, yeah, okay, right? So, so you do that. And, um, you know, it is, it is sort of nice to be able to tell somebody like, oh, honey, that's okay. But yesterday, I'll tell you the first two, it was a lot easier to say that's okay. The third thing was like a thing. It was like a thing. And I did not jump in to say that's okay. Person said, I feel like my life is over. I said, well, probably life is you knew it is over. <laughs> But that's different from your life being over. Yeah. Person, I, is this okay to tell you this? Yes. I don't think I'm violating any confidence because you don't know who it is. You don't know what I'm talking about. Person said, I think I'm generally a good person. I've just made this mistake. Mm -hmm. I probably think that's true, but I didn't want to hop in and minimize the mistake. <laughs> So I didn't, I just was quiet. Um, I think person was confessing grief that family wouldn't let this thing go. This person wanted it to be let go. It's like this good reminder, you don't get to decide when people let things go. There's what you'd like. So it sounds like you're confessing anxiety. You want a specific thing and they're not going to give it to you. And you want them to. I know what that's like, right? Like I've heard people before. I've apologized multiple times. I want it to be okay. But I think, and it is this fair or unfair, but my understanding of judgment is the injured person decides when it's over, not the perpetrator. That's true. Maybe that isn't fair, but that seems to be the way it goes, right? The injured person decides. So like, this is the difference between like when you help somebody financially or through a problem, the difference between you being the giver and you being the accompanier. When I give, I decide when I'm done. When I accompany, you decide when I'm done. I like giving, to be clear, because I decide when I'm done. 
thinking about the word I of spraying people out of purgatory. That always bothers me. When I, I heard on the radio. Do I think it's efficacious? No. Well, I just. Do I think it speaks to our feelings? Yes. No. Is it true? No. Are our feelings true? Yes. <laughs> I think it gives us comfort. Mm -hmm. Is it effectual? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't believe in the place to begin with, so how could there be any effect? I mean, of course, my beliefs don't matter. <laughs> the book reminded me. Um, but I don't believe in that. Yeah, I, I actually can understand if I was the person involved, I would, that, that's good. But I was thinking more of the church kind of, you, you pay money into it, I think, if you're, if you're having them pray for tour. But maybe I'm wrong about that. Well, there was a practice where, quite honestly, um, people would give donations to monasteries mm -hmm. with the understanding that that was supporting monks living mm -hmm. so that those people could be dedicated to prayer all day. Unfortunately, it became a quid pro quo, as most things do. Mm -hmm. Since I gave you money, pray for my dead uncle, mm -hmm. instead of I'm supporting you being able to dedicate yourself to prayer when I have to grow crops all day. <laughs> the original idea seems not so bad, but the quid pro quo seems not good to me. Judgment. I, can I just say one last thing about this? confession thing I did yesterday. I was talking to a person giving words of counsel and comfort. The person said, this seems very hard. I said, I think it seems very honest. <laughs> person says, I'm a good person. I made a mistake. And then person get, hits this wall. And I think it's because I didn't acquiesce that it's all going to be fine. I could be wrong, but in my head, this is what I tried to hold on, right? Person says, to whom much is given, much is required. So this is their criterion of judgment for themselves. Thought about that. This morning when we were doing our six miles, <laughs> I thought about that. My dad had this line. The second you think you're different from everybody else is the second you're just like everybody else. To whom much is given, much is required. Smacks of narcissism, doesn't it? <laughs> of course, I find that judgment really hard because, like, I can do certain things very well. And I think I have, there's much required from me. But as I was sitting there yesterday, and I don't know if this was the right thing to say, when person said, to whom much is given, much is required, my response is, God requires you to live your life. That's what's required to live your life. I didn't hear if that's right. But I think it might be. Instead of God requires you to change the world or cure cancer or blank, what God requires is that you live. And I mean with like a capital L. And particularly, I would say this, um, I really try to avoid profanity in church, but in this moment, it seemed <laughs> it seemed okay not to avoid it because of the person and the context, mm -hmm. right? And so person had said something about life being effed up, and so what's required is that we live our effed up lives. Live, with a capital mm -hmm. L, our effed up lives, instead of the ones we don't have. I don't know if that's what God's really rooting for or judging. Did you live? Not did you do enough? I always wonder if I did enough. I always, you know, like what's enough? What is enough? Did you do enough for your kids? You hope so. Well, but tell me how you, you feel. No, about. you can't. Do you do feel everything. like you did enough for your kids? I don't know. Any parent feels like they've done enough for their kids unless they were really bad parents. <laughs> I hope yeah. you don't mind me saying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. feels like. Yeah. yeah. Feeling. I'm able to get some distance from my feelings and say, maybe I didn't, but I, I put what I had in. Right? Uh -huh. You can't give what you don't have. 
So I'm able to have some difference from that. I wish I'd had more to give, but if I'm really honest, I didn't. I can now go back at a decision I made 15 years ago and say, I should have done that different. But at the time, man, that was the, that was the best I could do. Right. And it seemed so right. You know, it just seemed so right. Of course, I realized later I could have probably done that better. But then you use the E word, that enough word, which I think is we tie really strong judgment to enough. And that's a tough, that's a tough one. I think it's tying it to the outcome. <laughs> We're not in control of the outcome. Well, wouldn't you like to be? Yes, and that's, <laughs> that's why we say I didn't do enough. Because I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get what I wanted. But we can't control what our kids are going to do or what they're going to grow, grow up to be or their outcome. Does it come with age that you come to the realization that you didn't do enough, but you did the best you could with what you had at the time? It may. It, I don't think necessarily. And what is enough? Yeah. Yeah. What is enough? My Nobody spiritual. He gave us a book and said, here is the perfect way to raise this child when he's born. Yeah. You have your you have your core values, your morals, your ethics, you acquire along the way. Maybe in the wrong church, maybe in the wrong family, but you end up as an adult. You're this person. And I do believe you do the best you can with your children. Most of us do. And you know you make mistakes, you're not perfect. Nobody is. But that doesn't mean you didn't try. And you don't have total control. You never did. Because that's a separate human being. We're human beings. Yeah. And and two or more children in a family can be raised the same. And they're totally different people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're born with different personalities, mm -hmm. characteristics. You know, it wasn't until this past year that I understood that the DNA that I get from my parents isn't the same DNA that my brothers get. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't look alike. We don't sound alike we don't act alike but i thought you know mm -hmm. not being a scientific kind of person i thought that we were the same but we're not the same from the moment of conception we're not the same back to confession i, I think that um Anybody here Catholic or former Catholic Catholicism? Just got to see it. Yeah, I, I think that um, I grew up in a Catholic family. And going to confession meant you were forgiven. And that person forgave you. So I think a lot of times when those of us who don't I'll speak for myself, don't feel the priest can forgive you, um, they come to someone and they expect your forgiveness. And what purpose of that was, I think, or is, is to put that burden off of you, but not so much, you know, to share that burden with someone mm -hmm. confidentially, which really helps you as a mm -hmm. soul or whatever, you know, <clears throat> to tell someone you trust and talk it over. But for that person to say that they forgive you, maybe when people go to confession, they're seeking that forgiveness that they're not getting from their family or for is it forgiveness or can is I it say something? What's the difference? Yes. Uh I I was raised Catholic also. Very, very Catholic. And I remember an experience I had in confession that really 
and, and I went to Catholic school. So I was in Catholic school, raised Catholic, did all, did all the things, you know, in, in due time and all that. And as an adult, I was in confession. And I don't remember exactly what it was that I said, or was it, was it a sin? I'm not sure. But the priest said to me, he said, you are in confession. You are sitting in front of God. It's not just this priest, but God is there. And, and I guess you could, someone would say, well, God is everywhere. But in, in, the, in the confession, you're, he said, you're in front of God and he's hearing everything you see. He knows, he knows all of it, this. So you need to forgive yourself and move on because God has already done that. And, I, and maybe on the surface, it sounds a little simplistic, but it's a pretty beautiful thought, I think, I thought at the time. And I always fall back on that, on the priest saying that, and he was so gentle and so kind um, that, that I just, I, I have a very strong feeling and thought about, about that whole act of confession, or maybe, you know, other people don't go in front of a person, but you're talking to God about what you think you've done wrong or you want forgiveness for. I don't know. That's just my little piece about being Catholic and going to confession pretty regularly. Yeah, and Gracie, I agree with you. It's, it, you can confess to God anywhere. I, you know, the point I was trying to make is that perhaps this person was ex had the expectation that by confessing to Mike that uh -huh. he was given, when in reality he confessed to God. Yes, exactly. Though that I I agree with that. I think he did confess to God, and Mike. But Mike was a human being that was there. Uh, you're, you're smiling, Mike. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm trying to think. Is of course we never know what somebody else thinks, but I guess from from my perspective, it's one thing to say a prayer, which you very much believe in your mind, and it's another thing to say something to an embodied human being who's in a position of authority or judgment or representation. Yes. And the two of those kind of go together. Actually, at my middle confession, which was more about like a maybe a personality kind of trait, like a shadow that keeps being cast, person said, I need to say this to you in your collar. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not like, I'm not even like God's representative, but in some ways, yeah, I mean, I'm like, like this body and you're only as sick as your secrets. And there's things you can tell God that God knows your secrets, but until you've told them to another human being, they're still pretty secret. Like, let's just yeah. be honest, right? And so right. things that we can be so afraid of, often when you hear what people are really afraid of, it's almost laughable. And if I told you what I was really afraid of, you'd probably laugh too. You'd probably say, that is so silly that that's the thing you worry about, right? But to be able to sit there straight faced and say, look, like on God's behalf, what's done is done. But, but you're given that authority by the Bible. Uh, maybe. I think I'm probably given that authority by each and every one of you. I mean, I don't think I have that authority and in, independent of whether you think I have it or not. I would tell you that people in the, like the, fundamentalist traditions like evangelicals they don't think i have that authority at all that's fine their pastor does until he does something wrong and then he doesn't have authority this is sort of how that tends to go right and i think what what we get here if you're still here i think what we get is i'm not any better than any of you in fact i'm probably like less mature and in some ways have like inferior piety but i am in this role and I don't have to be perfect to do the role, but I do, at certain moments, I need to carry that role very carefully. Not all the time, but particularly in a moment like that, where somebody's saying, essentially, I don't know what God thinks about what I did. It becomes really important for me to say, well, you know, none of us really know about God. Our personal opinions don't matter. For me, it's really important to say, like, look on God's behalf, live the rest of your life. 
Yes. So leave that thing here. You, know, you do what you can, learn from it, but instead of being anxious, maybe grieve it. Grieve it until you can be grateful for the new person you could become. Maybe that's wrong. I didn't think so, though. I think that like speaks to the need of this. We were always told you don't need a human's forgiveness. You need God's. No. I, I think that's totally wrong. I think it's totally wrong. I think God's forgiveness is already on the table, period. What we need is like embodiment to figure that out. Yes. Like when you say the thing you're most afraid of and somebody says, I hear you're afraid of that, I'm not. <laughs> it's an invitation for you not to be afraid of that. It's to get it off your chest sometimes, help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, in, and I think when we do confession, it's not even the thing you're worried about. It's God's viewpoint of you that you're worried about. And for me, it's what are you going to do with this? How we? How has this changed you? How could it change you? What have you learned from it? It, it goes back to the the AA concept of making living amends. Yeah, it's not just saying mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's changing your behavior toward others to demonstrate that I really am sorry enough to do something about it. So I, I like to think of it as, as, yeah, you did this, but what are you going to do with it now? Mm -hmm. I think I've told you this story. I called the bishop one day in a real tizzy with some real important information that was going to you know inform me one of his decisions. And when I was done, his reply was, so what'd you learn about yourself? <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> that isn't why I'm calling you. I'm calling to tell you to help you make a judgment. <laughs> okay, and what'd you learn about yourself was his response. Hmm. That's probably what his analyst does with him. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a better way to live, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking to Darlene about this. I had, I had, this is a thing, like, so that you know what a base human being is. I am. Um, <laughs> I found out this thing about one of my kids. One of my kids did a thing they shouldn't have done like seven years ago. And to be honest, it's one of those things where it's like, oh my God, I can't believe my kid did that. Just like, it's tough. Like it hits you with like a shame center that I'm somehow involved in this. And what's interesting is I, I asked my kid, my kid said, here's what happened with a lot of like, I think remorse and regret and sadness. And it was like, hmm, okay, you just told me this thing without me knowing what it was. Like I asked you and you told me, so what's my response, response gonna be? I can't believe you did that. What a disappointment. In the moment it was, I'm really glad you told me that instead of me finding out some other way. <laughs> and I'm glad you have the sorrow over that. And I don't think any less of you, and we're going to figure out how this unravels. That seems like a good way to judge. <laughs> I don't know. I don't mean I did it right. I'm just surprised I didn't do the other things, the things like, I can't believe it. Like, you've got to, like, write a, you must do blank, blank, blank to make it right. I didn't somehow do those things, which I'm really glad of. But it was hard not to do those things. Because those are the things I would think about myself. I would think, well, you're not sorry enough. There comes back to that word enough. You're not sorry enough. Because if you were sorry enough, you would mourn this the rest of your life. Life is too short for that, though, isn't it? And I think God would say, you said you're sorry. That's enough. I mean, there may, I don't know if the, that situation was about, but basically there's there's a place where if it's done, well, I'm, and I'm going back to the, 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 the issue of confession, or I don't know, if you confess to tell a cop you ran a stoplight or read a stop sign or something, I, I don't know. Um, 
the fact that you admit what you did and you, you're willing to quote unquote pay for it, then that's the end of the story, so to speak, maybe. That story. Mm. For me, it's the first step. Well, yes, no doubt about that. Um, it's the first step. Thank you for clarification on that. I, I think they didn't learn. They needed to learn when they said. Yeah, what they, happens? Case if... says what happens if they do it again? And my response was, well, they didn't learn what they needed to learn from it. And then I said, were they really sorry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it takes more than just I'm sorry for me, in my opinion. Well, historically, what it takes in the church is contrition and penance. <laughs> and this is it. Yeah. It's what it is. And AA is really clever. Sometimes you're wanting to do penance makes things worse, so keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. and, we do and, things, and I, I, I meet with people who do this. My kids are so mad at me, and I've told them, you know, I've confessed to God and God's forgiven me and I want you to forgive me like God. It's sort of like, that's really manipulative. Because yeah, <laughs> now you're bringing God into the equation saying they should not be mad at you anymore. And the AA concept is if you should make amends to the person you've hurt them unless. unless it does harm to them or others. And I think it always does harm when we try to make amends with a string attached. Yeah, I fixed it now you can't be mad at me anymore. You always feel mad at me. That's always harmful. Because I decide when you're done hurting instead of you. I wish people didn't hurt the rest of our lives, but I'm not, I don't know that I'm always in control of when I let go of hurt, to be honest. Mm -hmm. There's times I'd like to let it go and I just for some reason can't. It isn't that I won't, it's that I didn't even know how. So how does God judge my inability? I would hope with compassion. I see you can't let that go. I see that you can't. I was teaching in fifth grade and this young boy uh, misbehaved. And um, I corrected him and he did it again. So I asked him to go out and sit outside for a few minutes and think about what he had done and let me know when he was ready to come back in. So I went on teaching and after, I don't know, five minutes or so, I opened the door and I said, are you ready to come back in? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I did three more times. And I said, can we talk about this? And he said, no, not yet. He, okay, so I I learned a very valuable lesson from that trader that it isn't when you're ready, mm -hmm. it's when they're ready. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and eventually we sat down and talked about it. And he told me how he was hurt that I had put him outside, outside the classroom. Yeah. That was the issue. Mm -hmm. And he was sorry he had done what he had done, but he was mad at me for putting him outside. Uh, but, you know, you, you can learn valuable life lessons from the youngest of, mm -hmm. of and, us. And he learned how to work through that with you so to a resolution. Because he, he needed that. Yeah. Because time. I didn't say, well, you're done with this. Come back in the room. I waited for him to be ready to talk about it. Jared. So I had a judgment moment Saturday night. <laughs> Saturday night, I went to the Half Shearsville Travel Gala up at the Junior League. And this is in general like a church supported thing. It was casual dress, 50s and 60s. <laughs> a couple of people had pink lady jackets on, right? My wife bought like a polka dot dress and put like this thing in her hair. She looked like somebody totally different. I had decided <laughs> I'll I'll do this, but I'm not gonna like buy things. So mm -hmm. I wore a white t-shirt and some jeans and I have some Converse 
And I borrowed a pack of cigarettes from somebody and rolled them up in my sleeve. And I put a cigarette behind my ear. And I was like, oh, my God, like, I am the worst dressed person at this event. <laughs> and I was. Like, I am like the kid that the dad doesn't want coming to their house. This is kind of what I look like. We had name tags. They had made name tags. Mine said, Reverend Mike Stone. <laughs> So the event's fine. We're in line, our little table. Almost there's like nine other people there. We're going to check out. We're chatting. Again, I'm probably the worst dressed one there because I didn't have a leather jacket. And I didn't want to buy one. So this man walks by who I've never seen before. I don't know him. And he says, Hugh, I have this just for you. And he hands me this paper. And I was a little confused because, again, I didn't think I know this guy. And I look down at the paper and I immediately know what it is before I need to turn it over. It's a million dollar bill. Of course, that's not a real thing. We all know that. You know what's on the other side. This is the most valuable piece of paper in your life. If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? If you did die to them and you stood before God and God said, why would I let you into my heaven? What would you say? So it took me longer to get to the reaction of. It was a very negative reaction. Yeah. It doesn't matter that I'm a priest, although in my story, it probably does. It's sort of like. You judge me. Just me and this whole line of people is needing this piece of paper based on how I look. Maybe not. That's just what I thought, right? And I'm even wearing the damn name tag, right? Like, and I'm the one who bought the table at the thing. And you thought I needed this paper. You didn't ask me for my name. You didn't say hello. You said, this is what you need. I used to do shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> and what I would have realized, of course, is like the indignation I've got about being judged. I don't know. I actually don't know what he was thinking at all. I don't know. But I do kind of think when you give pieces of paper like that out, in general, you probably think of a pretty hard God akin to Jonathan Edwards, which, by the way, like makes me ill to read that. Yeah. Um, and I realized, of course, Mike, who could you give that paper to who would not feel judged by you? Like if somebody had a heroin needle in their elbow and had just converted to violent Islam and you gave them that paper, would they find compassion in that or would they find condemnation? And, you know, we, it's just so weird about this workbook because I think it really wants to have its cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. True love drives down all fear, but you should be afraid of God's judgment. That doesn't make any sense. Like, those are completely oxymoronic things yeah. to put together. Is this man afraid I'll go to hell when I die? That's a thing to go to confession for. Not to give to somebody else. Is this man afraid he'll go to hell because to whom much is given, much is required, like he needs to like convert people to the Lord or do his damnedest or God's going to punish him for not doing enough? That's the thing you go to confession for. I confess, I have a really unhealthy view of judgment. I wrap God up in it. Can you help me? <laughs> I confess to you all, I have a really unhealthy standards of judgment. <laughs> I'm afraid to let them go. Because I'm afraid if I'm not harsh on myself, I'll be lazy. Mm -hmm. Or I won't do anything. Or I'll be morally depraved. I, I mean, this is like how we feed that fear. Mm -hmm. If I let it go, I won't do anything. And I don't want to be one of those people who does nothing. <laughs> All tied up in judgment, right? It is exhausting, 
and and yet, like, so we carry this burden around. The Bible has a name for that. It's called sin. And we're afraid what will happen if we put it down because we've been carrying that so long. Maybe we just need to carry a little further and it would all turn out. Instead of, you mean I could have put that down 30 years ago? <laughs> Rarely do people say, you mean I didn't have to carry it this long? They might say, like, are you sure this is okay? Instead of, oh my God, I wish I'd done this 20 years ago. That's what confessions are about, just do it. Dude, I know I'm talking a lot about confession because I did it yesterday and it's on my mind, but like, but like, I think this is like this part of this, this judgment part, right? Like, yeah. it just seems really hard. And, you know, of course, nuance is everything. One of the men yesterday, the men's group yesterday said this really interesting thing to me that I think you would like if we do it right. So, Jim Smalley used to be the priest here. To be honest, he was the last priest you all had that you loved. He was. And he, he didn't stay long. And he went to know, Beaumont or something. And he wrote parts. Well, because people loved him there too. And he didn't stay. And that was hard. <laughs> but one of the things that Jim did there, see this 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 man was a member there when Jim was there. Ah. He said, yeah, Jim did this thing during Lent where like he had this like basket of nails mm -hmm. that he asked people, like a flat, square head nail. Probably a horseshoe nail, mm -hmm. honestly. And he asked people to carry them around all Lent as like a reminder of like, well, what's causing them pain that they're trying to give up. And then he said, um, what Jim did is on Good Friday, before the liturgy, you took your nail, if you wanted to, and you personally hammered it into the cross that gets carried in. In that, uh, on Easter Sunday, you hang your flower on that nail. Oh, oh what a ritual! That's you. So I, I thought about the, I, because of where I came from, I thought and that could be really awful in the sense that, hey, this thing I'm carrying, that's what killed Jesus. So I'm nailing Jesus to the cross with this thing. But I don't. But I, when I heard the story, I was like, oh, it's because I'm choosing to live it, leave it here. <laughs> I've carried this too long and now I'm going to leave it and I'm going to nail it in and I can't take it out. I have to leave it because <laughs> square haired nails are harder to pry out, just to be honest with you. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, that thing you left, you now get to beautify. I think we're going to do this next year. <laughs> I think it's fine. It sounds lovely. I, think. I, I like it when it's framed as this didn't kill Jesus. Jesus you can leave this with him. This thing that you're worried about with yourself, you can leave. And, and then having left, you can return to it because it's not yours anymore. You can say, I've left that shame. I've left that guilt. And now there's now there's beauty in it. Because I'm not carrying it anymore, it can now be beautiful. <laughs> but I think the nuancing makes all the difference. See, when I was a kid, there was a song by Ray Boltz, who was like this early Christian. You probably don't know who this is. I heard the name. This song called Feel the Nails. And the chorus goes, does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Have I crucified you, Jesus, with my sin? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of guilt. Every time I make up, it's like I'm killing Jesus again because somebody has to suffer for my mistakes. This is like this idea. I don't think that's particularly healthy. <laughs> I really don't, spiritually or psychologically or otherwise. Uh, but the other bit about, yeah, I think we're going to see judgment on Friday. Can I say this provocatively now? And I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, we call the day Good Friday now. Have you read that story? The one we read, the Passion Narrative? I don't think I it's think a it's very good. good story if you don't mind I actually find it very sad and I was talking to somebody a couple of years back and I introduced this concept that the earliest Christians called it Black Friday actually Definitely. because the day was dark yeah it makes more sense 
I was always uncomfortable with that when I was a kid. With Good Friday? With Good Friday. Why is it Good Friday? Well, because somebody told me here, well, yeah, I mean, it was bad for Jesus, but it was good for us. So that's why we picked this name. And I said, and maybe this is going to sound faithless. You'll probably hear me say this again on Friday. I think if we say the story is good for us, then it justifies what we did. We human beings mm -hmm. did to God being vulnerable. I think a better Friday would have been like, what should I do with Jesus? Let him go. <laughs> that would have been a better Friday. Yeah. I think the best Friday would have been like, man, Jesus, this is really challenging. Help us. <laughs> Instead of, oh, this is terrible. We'll kill you. Oh, you came back. That was real good for us. I think it's Black Friday. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus have to die? Well, all human beings die. So yeah, I guess so. Did he have to die by our hands? No, I think we picked that. Oh, but God wouldn't have forgiven us if, if Jesus hadn't died. I'm going to call baloney on that. <laughs> I wonder if the day isn't a reminder. Don't do this story again. Don't accept any good value from this story. This is the anti-story. Do not do this again. We did it. This is in us. If you don't think that's in you to do that to somebody, I'm going to send you to a psychologist. That is in you. <laughs> to be cruel. That is in every human being. Yeah. I, I hope we hear the story and say, God, never again. But we haven't learned that lesson because... Here we are more than a year and a month into this whole Russian Ukraine thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to say who, who's right and who's wrong, but it's Friday mm -hmm. in Ukraine. When we judge something as Jesus suffered for us, that's good. I just don't see how that's good because <laughs> that glorifies suffering. So what do, what do we as people do when we see these kind of issues? Like after the Holocaust, we said never again, yet it's mm -hmm. happening in China. Mm -hmm. with the and with the leaders, mean, what, yeah. what do you now do? Or what can we? Everybody's ignoring that. And it just this what, whole you know it's interesting. I and and I I think sometimes, and I don't want to say like this is just nowadays or this is cancel culture or whatever, but I think we do we struggle with extreme judgment. And one of the extreme judgments we suffer with is like, if I were in Germany, I always said no, I wouldn't have gone along with it because it was so evil. And it was really interesting. My wife, who is a better person than I am, when we went to the Holocaust Museum in DC last year, very hard. We watched all kind of film in there with Emery. My wife said, yeah, I probably would have gone along with it. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Like, how you, nobody would go along with it. She was like, I mean, you, you would have had everything to lose if you had it, right? And like, yeah, I mean, if you weren't Jewish, like, it wouldn't you, you know? Like, yeah, I probably would have gone along with it. Just ignore that. We're so programmed to say, not me ever. Yeah. But I think we don't realize that that's in us. I think we're afraid that the Holocaust could come from somebody like me. When we do that, we've judged Hitler as not being a human. And in so doing, we've lost our own humanity. I think that's what we do is we remember, hell, that could have been me. And since that could have been me. We do nothing. Then not we do nothing since that could be me what are the breaks i'm going to put into my life or socially what breaks i mean like the severe tire damage spikes so when i go down that road the car can't go anymore like how do we put safeguards in place so that when our inclinations start to take us one way there's enough other people that say or there's policies or there's this or that that say that's real sweet. You don't think you're going to go all the way. And just to make sure, I've taken the wheels off your car. <laughs> or we put up barricades. But I think to, to deny that this isn't in us 
A is disingenuous and B, it leads us to stripping other people of their humanity. And look, if Hitler wasn't human, then you can't judge him. If he wasn't fully human, then he can't be held responsible for what he did. So dignity is like required for accountability. We all get this. If you're like, if you're not aware of what you're doing, it's not fair to punish you as if you were, right? Like that's not fair. So if he was just demented and twisted, you don't try him in court, you put him in a mental institution. I'd probably rather go to the gallows than most mental institutions, the way we do those. Yeah. But, you, but you, you get what I'm saying? So what do we do? I think we have to be really vigilant. Anytime we see something, we say, how could somebody do that? The question is, okay, I've got that. And now let's turn that inward. And how can I be involved in helping there be some more boundaries so that we don't roll off the road? I don't know. My, when I was in Temple, I met a lady. Uh, she was a year younger than I was, and she was from Germany. And she had married an American vet and come back. And we, at a, in a book club, the discussion came up about Hitler. And would they do that? I wouldn't have done that. And she said, she, she was a Roman Catholic. She said, don't ever say you would not have done until you have walked that walk. Mm -hmm. My father did it. He was with Hitler. He didn't believe in it. But they threatened him, my mother, his life, everything. And he did it. And she said, I was born a year after the war was over. And never in my lifetime would he discuss the war. It was never mentioned in our home. So we don't know what we would do in a Holocaust situation. We like to think we wouldn't. But I've never forgotten that. And she would not... Uh, because of some of the reactions of the other girls, she would never discuss it. The two of us would discuss it, but she would never again discuss it in public. And I would tell you, this is pretty normal. What you said about her dad is pretty normal about dads I know who went to combat. Yes. They don't talk about it with their family. Mm -hmm. Probably because... Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure her father felt terribly guilty, don't you think? Probably ashamed. Ashamed, ashamed. yeah. Which is a lot worse than guilt. I mean, the things that my dad said, essentially, and he said it in a very weird way, like not at a point of shame, but as I think about it now, there was a lot of shame behind it. I mean, basically, what I got out of my dad was he killed women and children. And then he came home to a woman and had children. That's pretty hard to hold those things together. Yeah. He was able to justify, hey, I had a perimeter I was responsible for keeping. So if an animal came in it, we shot the animal. If a woman came in it, we shot the woman. This was posted, but this, this is what we did for our safety. So, okay, get it. You got this policy. And then you've also got this. I mean, look, we know it's wrong to shoot women. We make allowances for killing men, but killing women and children. That just is like deeply ingrained, unless you're a sociopath, like that's really deeply ingrained. There's gonna be like consequences, long-term consequences for doing those things, even if you had to. Of course, we know this, <coughs> people had bombs strapped to them. Like that yeah. was a real thing. You didn't know whether they had it or not. So what do you do? You, you, you take the risk that they just did it by accident or you risk every life on your base. And, and there's not even what you want, there's orders. The military doesn't do well with free thinking. Like it, it tries to get you to obey because that is how you're going, what's gonna be best for your unit. And, and then, so we do that and then, and then judgment. 
And then how are you supposed to live the rest of your life? Uh, we don't do a lot of good work on that. We're doing a little better than we did in Vietnam days, right? Yeah. Like, you know, something like half of homeless veterans are from the Vietnam War, like half of them. Yep. Because there was nothing for them when they got home except accusation, mm -hmm. right? It's not like those people signed up to go either. We made them go. You go or you go to jail. Yeah. You don't shoot. Are you a coward? You go to jail. You go to jail. And and then you, I can't believe you shot people there. <laughs> it wasn't a good war. Well, thanks. Nobody asked me, right? I mean, like, this yeah. is just, this is life. And so then how do you live with your own judgment? And there was this moment, right? I mean, I can tell you, like, one of these, sometimes you have these moments of compassion for your parents. Usually, I grew up, that's not a thing you do. They don't need it because they're, like, tough and you're the kid, right? But, like, you know, towards the end of his life, my dad was living in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, there was medication that helped, but he would just have nightmares. Yeah. of whatever it was and he didn't talk about what they were but like I think one day my dad said to me like I'm living in hell every day mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to do and 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 the hell right is in here it's not somewhere after you die and it's related to this judgment I did this thing I was doing my duty but it was wrong or how come I got to do this and then I get to have my kids and nobody's coming over here and doing what I did to their kids? Survivor's guilt. I mean, Andy Doyle said, this is really clever. He, just offhand, we were having lunch one day and he was talking about something totally different. He said, look, we all know killing is wrong. We all know it's wrong. And then soldiers kill people and we say, good job. And that's why we'll always need chaplains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and chaplains to do what I think probably help us sort yeah. through this yeah. I do wonder if we're afraid of it because again the notions we know were about consider when you go to trial in the United States there are two verdicts that can be returned. Guilty, guilty not. not guilty. There's no innocent verdict. There's guilty or not guilty based on the evidence. There's no innocent verdict. Of course, most of us know if you were you went on trial, eh, maybe something wrong with you. <laughs> they found you not guilty, but yeah, they just get a trial. You must not be that person we thought you were. There's no exoneration. There's just, yeah, we didn't find you with. We carry judgment like that. I'm afraid we do. And I'm afraid we put it onto God. And again, what we judge as good or bad seems to influence all of that. Coming back to Good Friday, is it good that Jesus was killed? I think it was really not good. <laughs> Can I tell you, I think it was really not good. I think what's interesting about the story is, you know, God's response is like, God is not defined by something we did. I'd like to live like that. It's pretty hard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I would not like for the people who have hurt me to define me. Mm -hmm. with their hurt mm -hmm. and maybe that's what i hear psychologically the invitation of the resurrection is the hurt doesn't go away but you are not confined to the tomb there is life after hurt i mean i think without that hope it's hard to make progress in therapy if there, if there can be something else it will never be what it was and it could be better hey mike please but I understand what you're saying, but isn't that part of the plan for Jesus to die and to be resurrected? I don't know, Tim. 
I think sometimes if we say God wanted it to happen the way we did, then we justify suffering and evil in the world. What if the plan was, I'm going to be embodied. I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to show you physically what love looks like. For a long time. For as long as I can. And yeah, I am going to die because you died too. But we sped that up. I don't know what God's plans are, you know? Like, I don't know. But didn't the prophets predict yeah. this? Well, it's interesting. When you read Isaiah, it talks about the suffering servant, but it's really clear from every Hebrew Bible scholar that the suffering servant is the people of Israel or Cyrus the Persian. And I think kind of what they suggest is like, hey, being faithful to God and being faithful to love and being vulnerable, that hurts sometimes. It is not always socially acceptable. I think that's true. I would say, and, and this is, I think, just really basic that we, we, I don't think we don't, and sometimes we push things so hard that we lose like the intent, but like, I think loving somebody else always involves suffering because you're not in control of what they do with them. Not only you're not in control of the outcomes, they may not even want your love. But that hurts. I want you to like my love. I want you to enjoy it. What's the alternative? Harden your heart. There's times we do that so we can survive. The pain of loving is just too much. We harden our hearts as a coping mechanism, right? But it's not the right, it's not the way to live. It's the way we cope. So what is it for the person who was wrong, say an extramarital affair? That person may be able to forgive, but the love changes. And so is that wrong to say to that person, you know, I'll always love you. I'm just not in love with you. Yeah. You know, I heard a really interesting conversation from Scott Peck about how falling in love with somebody has nothing to do with love. <laughs> falling in love is usually a biochemical reaction that's related to sexuality. So maybe it makes you interested in loving somebody, but it has nothing to do with it. Love, he says, is extending yourself for the purpose of growing somebody else. Uh, I know lots of people who are married who do not love each other. They do not extend themselves in any way for one another. I think you'd also be surprised how many people have affairs. It is so many more people than you think. And they don't do it to hurt the other person. They do it. They couldn't tell you why. A lot of times they do it to get the other person back involved in their lives. I know that sounds crazy, but everybody I've met who's had an affair, that's what it's been about, escape. Mm -hmm. I'm missing something. I want you to pursue me, or I just thought life would be a lot better. And usually what they say is, and I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. That was a fantasy. But at the time, it seemed so what I needed. So it's your fault. No, when it goes well, it's not that it's our fault. Uh, it could be that way. I think when we do it right, I mean, I think what we say is, look, like I'm I'm uncomfortable in the relationship, but I am not going to go out the exit doors until I've leaned into it. And it is an interesting thing. This same guy, Scott Peck, talks about like, he says right up front, life is suffering, but knowing that life has suffering in it somehow takes the suffering out of it. Excellent. And acceptance and the way that we handle that acceptance is through discipline the four core disciplines he names are delayed gratification balance taking responsibility and honesty and he says that um the real problem now this is a different definition of laziness he says the real problem is we're lazy because we don't want to confront a problem we want to try to avoid it this is why people tell lies, because they think we can walk around a problem instead of embracing the problem. And um, I would say that extramarital affairs tend to be lazy ways of avoiding problems. But the person, it, I don't think it's wrong that, I don't know about this guy that was talking, a woman was talking to you, but I don't think it's wrong. I mean, his expectation and anger or whatever is that 
the wife won't or spouse won't come around. But in her their defense, maybe they're I'm not sure I could do that. No, and look, I, I don't know if you've ever found this line in your own marriage where somebody's like, you do this thing constantly. And you said, you knew that when you married me. <laughs> so I don't know what you were thinking, but I've never been anything other than that. <laughs> and it is true. Be, be careful you marry. You better love them like they are. Because if you marry a fixer-upper, who knows what's breaking next? <laughs> And a lot of it still comes back to our judgment, right? Do we judge problems as so uncomfortable that we need to run away or do we judge them as opportunities to grow? And it is true that different problems I judge differently. There are some problems I will run right to. <laughs> and then there are some that I'm like, yeah, but nah. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. We minimize. Maybe if I do nothing, it'll go away. You know, maybe we don't tell a bold faced lie, but we're not completely <laughs> honest with all the information, right? And so then we come back to judgment. I mean, I sure hope God understands why I have trouble facing certain kinds of problems. I hope so. I don't mean it's okay. I just hope God understands. I, I think probably God understands. I think so. So if, if God is like that, hell, maybe we're supposed to be like that. Or at least try. Or at least try especially when we look at the mirror, especially then, especially when somebody says, I can't believe you did this. This becomes a really good time. Instead of being reacted to, to look at ourselves and say, hmm, you must not know me very well <laughs> <laughs> or other human beings. We are capable of much worse. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say the one point you made in the video is really, really helpful. If Christ is the judge, then we'd better quit doing it. If we really believe it, we'd better quit. Rarely do I see people who say, God's coming to judge, who accept the corollary, that means it's not for us to do. Usually, since God's coming to judge, I'll jumpstart the process right now. So I hope that's a helpful thing that he did identify. A, hopefully God judges differently than we do. And B, even if we don't know how, if God's going to do it, let God do it. And at the end of your life, wouldn't you rather be wrong in the generous category than in the petty category? Hey, Mike. Yes, sir, please. You know, I think, though, each one of us has a little bit of Jonathan Edwards in us. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. Get him out of me, please. <laughs> no, I think you're right. And I think that's why we go to confession. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> that's the proper use of confession. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, that's why we go to confession. Okay. I will see you all next week. And what do you know? We're talking about resurrection.